Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Ryan Oklowitz. I'm Global Marketing Manager with PMMI. And on behalf of PMMI and our Global Marketing Committee, I want to thank you for joining our webinar today. Today's webinar is one in a series of webinars, seminars, and events that PMMI has planned this year to help PMMI members grow their export sales. To find out what other events we have coming up, uh, including events and services at uh, uh, Expo Pack Mexico and other trade shows that we'll be present at throughout uh, around the globe this year, I encourage you to take a moment and uh, visit PMMI.org uh, backslash global for more information. Today's webinar uh, figures to be an exciting one. Uh, explores the Brazilian market uh, for packaging and processing machinery and equipment. Uh, for many members, the idea of doing business in Brazil uh, is uh, a challenging thought. It's a it's a distant prospect, um, and and it's mainly due to the custo Brazil or the infamous Brazil cost, uh, which is uh, could be a result of high import prices, high interest rates poor infrastructure, low productivity, rigid labor laws. Uh, there, there's a gamut of things that add to the price of uh, your machines, which uh, have been known to be increased by 40 to 60 percent when doing business in Brazil. Uh, but that has not discouraged uh, growth in U.S. exports of packaging machinery to Brazil. Uh, exports of U.S. machinery to Brazil have doubled in the past six years, from 22 million to 58 million just last year. Uh, and the fact that Brazil is one of the largest economies located in our hem hemisphere, Brazil uh, needs to be on everybody's uh, radar. Uh, to give us an update on the business climate in Brazil and understand the competitive environment for PMMI members, with us today is AJ and Anand Himnani, brothers and founders of Indobras Consulting, a market research and strategy firm with offices in Sao Paulo. Both Anand and AJ have extensive experience analyzing the packaging machinery and capital goods sectors in Brazil and have conducted many market research reports for PMI members over the past 15 years. They are here to share their findings today of a newly released report which is available for download as well on PMMI.org. Some quick housekeeping items before I turn this over to AJ and Anand. I want to bring to your attention that you have entered the webinar in muted mode. And if you'd like to ask a question at any time during the presentation, to please enter it in the chat box in the lower left portion of the screen. All questions will be read at the end of the presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded, so we will share both the presentation and audio with you after we conclude here today. So without further ado, I will be happy to turn the presentation over to Mr. Himnani. AJ, all yours. Hey, Ryan. This is uh, Anand. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, thanks, a, thanks for the introduction, Ryan. Thanks also for, uh, for putting rightfully all the daunting um, issues that uh, one has to tackle when uh, thinking about Brazil. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to just, uh, by way of introduction, just uh, reemphasize that, you know, we've, uh, I've, been, I've been assisting companies um, in the capital goods space in Brazil for about 18 years now, um, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a bumpy ride, but it's been a good one. And uh, there's, a, you know, there's a, there's a great quote that I'd like to uh, preempt my, uh, my presentations with uh, from Louis Greitner um, that, uh, that, uh, from IBM, who said that, you know, well, once you decide to go in, it's a full body immersion, and uh, I think that 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 sort of epitomizes Brazil. Uh, it's uh, it's you know it's not for the weak of heart, but uh, again, it's 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 an exciting market. It's uh, you know arguably you know uh, the world's second best uh, you know uh, market in terms of a demographic dividend. And I'm gonna you know what what I want to try to do today is uh, walk you uh, all through some of the. Uh, the macro issues, and then um, you know, Ajay, my partner, will get into uh, some of the weeds of the report and uh, how we've seen uh, differentiation tactics by European vendors and Brazilian vendors uh, compared to some, what uh, what what a lot of the U.S. companies and um, some of the smaller European companies have uh, you know shied away from typically. And um, you know that 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 hopefully just helps us in articulating a strategy and more than strategy, just more tactical. Um, real life pragmatic um, things that can be done to uh, offset some of these uh, these Brazil costs as, uh, as Ryan put it but I also wanted to try to get you to understand um, Brazil costs because it's not you know it's not as daunting as 40 or 60 percent um, because uh, as Einstein says in in relativity 
uh, Brazilian manufacturers actually pay the lion's share of that 60% uh, delta that, uh, that you're looking at anyway. So it, when you look at a, de a deferential basis or, or a, a relative basis, it's not near as daunting as all that. Um, anyway, um, I wanted to move to you know, sort of the first slide, which is, um, you know, I, I, I like this, um, this, this. This is a slide that we picked up from Bloomberg, um, uh, an analyst that, we, we, that I follow pretty well, put it together. And, you know, the, the punchline is obviously the end of the party, right? If you, if you thought about Brazil over the last three years, you know, everyone was rushing there, right? You know, uh, you couldn't get uh, hotel rooms in Sao Paulo and, you know, airline tickets on American United and Delta were, you know, were almost double the price of what they are right now. Um, it, it's, you know, Brazil obviously went through a, an incredible boom, um, a large, largely due to government spending and a consumer uh, indebtedness um, uh, uh, increase. And there's, there's, there's what, I, what, I, what I consider to be a retrenching, and uh, the Brazilian economy is retrenching. We're, we're, we're in for at least, um, and again, you know, I, I, I told you I've been doing this for 18 years, so I'm, I, I tend to be more cynical than most. But uh, you know we're we're going into a you know a stagnation period in in GDP growth per se, and um, we're not going to come out of it. You know it's going to take us at least four to six quarters to come out of it. The government, uh, the new finance minister, he's a very very good guy, and um, you know he's he's you know articulated a plan that's passed in Congress and the Senate to increase the tax burden, increase interest rates, and um, you know, in, in, in implement a very aggressive um, uh, private investment uh, program in the concession space, in, um, in highways, in ports, in airports, and in energy plants, and water and wastewater plants. We've had, we have what, 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 uh, what is a growing um, government uh, debt. You have a, you know, a, a currency that's actually depreciated um, you know, we, I remember uh, clients of ours, um, you know, uh, importing equipment into Brazil two years ago um, at an exchange rate of 1.6. Um, you know, the exchange rate today is at 3.2. You know, it, it truly is one of the most wildly oscillating and fluctuating exchanges in the world. I think it, it, it loses out only to Turkey in terms of uh, the number of standard deviations that it, um, it, it, it oscillates to. Again, it, 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 it poses a challenge, but it's, um, it, it, it suffice to say that you know, we, we as you know, American exporters going into Brazil have to understand that you know, there, is, there has been a devaluation to the dollar that's surpassed the devaluation to the euro. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, it's a double whammy. It's not only that our products are more expensive, um, these are U.S. products are more expensive, but it's also you're more expensive against, um, against you know, some of your larger competitors being, you know, Italian, German um, uh, vendors. Uh, the, the, the second thing is that obviously Brazil is a pretty commodity-dependent economy, so, you know, we, we are seeing a little bit of, um, you know, a, 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 a bumpy road in, in the commodity pricing, but you know, it's 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 um, it's fleeting. You know, um, you, you you see prices of all, all the large soy. Again, Brazil's Brazil's you know either the largest or second largest exporter of a lot of the uh, the basic commodities. You know, everything from soy to cotton to um, to corn to iron ore, um, and uh, you know orange juice and coffee, uh, etc. So. Um, you know, it, it is a pretty commodity-dependent economy. You know, as commodity prices begin to edge up again um, towards uh, as they have over the last month and, and a half, we will see some of this malaise or you know the, the, the issues in the economy you know um, uh, improving. Um, having said that, the main thing on on, on equipment um, and, and and consumer, uh, I mean, packaging equipment is really consumer demand, and consumer demand is going to. Um, stay uh, stagnated, if you would, um, for at least a couple quarters before it starts picking up again. Um, the, um, the 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 other thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is that you know a lot of a lot of what's happening um, you know with the inflation, with the exchange rate, and um, with interest rates are it's 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 market economics, but it's also politics. You know, our our president uh, Dilma, she has she enjoys I think what is the lowest popularity rating in the history of uh, polls. She's at under nine percent now. Um, it's um, it's very very difficult for her to get anything done at this at this point. So the country is uh, de facto being run by the finance minister, and um, you know every you know he's got the um, you know he's got a tremendous amount of power right now, and he's a Chicago educated. 
you know, World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank trained, um, you know, uh, tenured executive. He used to, he used to run one of the, uh, the, the large uh, private bank asset management companies. So, you know, I, I've got a lot of confidence in him, um, uh, and we, we believe that, you know, this, this, um, this shock or this retrenching that he's um, implementing in terms of increasing interest rates and, um, you know, really shaking out um, consumer demand um, so that you get indebtedness, uh, at, you know, to, to become a little bit lower, um, is a necessary evil to get um, to get growth back into the system and confidence back into the system over the next couple of quarters. Um, so let me let me let me run you through slide uh, number four now, which is um, something that I've always found very interesting. But if you if you look at you know what it costs um, a Brazilian manufacturer to borrow, um, it's 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 significantly higher than the U.S. Obviously, um, you know obviously, but. If you look at what it costs a Brazilian consumer to borrow, you know we're, we're looking at nine and a half percent per month, right? So, if I overdraw my credit card, I'm paying nine and a half percent per month, and that's compounded month on month. So, the Brazilian economy is um, it, it, it's pretty incredible in in that if you look at it from from your perspective, right? With a good technology, with uh, with, de with decent service, and with local presence. Um, and with you know U.S. cost of capital, you've just you, you're just about 19% or you know 15% more competitive than your Brazilian counterpart, um, and that's something that's 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 little appreciated by by, by most of most of the, most of the folks that are exporting down to Brazil, and are complaining about you know how how expensive it is to do business there, but the main thing you you know what 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 I wanted to reemphasize is that it's expensive for the local guys too, and um, the next slide is something that we put together. Um, which which really does summarize that um, in that it it's something that's um, you know th th this is this is something that was sponsored by the Brazilian government through the National Con um, Confederation of uh, Industries where they actually did a benchmarking by country in terms of productivity right and what happens is that you know besides the cost of capital being very high the cost of labor is also very high. If I, if you know, if you pay um, a factory worker a thousand dollars in the states, you're paying a thousand dollars in Brazil plus a hundred, a hundred and two percent social security benefit. So he's actually running you, you know, cost a company double. Um, and labor in Brazil is um, is expensive. It's um, it's social security, you know, amplifies that expense. So what what you end up with is a is a situation where you're competing against folks that are, you know that have a ball and chain, you know, permanently tied to them. Um, so despite the exchange rate devaluation and despite, um, you know, uh, the, the, the import duties and the cascading um, uh, uh, VAT taxes that, uh, that, that come, up, uh, come upon the import duties, you have to understand that, you know, the, the, the Brazilian manufacturers are all competing against you but having to pay all of that and then some. So it, it's, it's, almost, um, it's almost counterintuitive to think of Brazil as, oh, it's an expensive place to do business, so I won't do it. It's, it's, it's more like, oh, shoot, it is an expensive place to do business, but it's so much more expensive to, to the local guys that, you know, I must be there because I'm going to be more competitive. And, and, you know, if I'm competing against someone that has a cost of capital of, you know, 20% a year and I can't make money there, then I'm doing something wrong. Um, you know, again, the, 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 the other thought before we get into the weeds of the, um, of the slide deck is that, if you look at the size of the country and if you look at the demographic dividend the country has to offer, you know, it's, it is going to be, you know, without a doubt, a, the fifth largest economy in the world you know, within, within a few short years. It is the size of the continental U.S., which poses you know, problems and opportunities, right? Because problems are you know, obviously distribution related and figuring out how to, um, how to work with local value added manufacturing and local, con local distributors to actually reach each corner of Brazil. You would not have, for example, an exclusive distributor in the US, nor should you have someone like that in Brazil. It's too large, no one can actually touch um, all the different uh, consumer clusters in Brazil, you know, within one roof. So, um, you know, my, my, my message is that it's, it's a very large country. It's obviously, you know, uh, 210 million consumers uh, with an increasing consumer base, but it's also um, a large country in terms of geographic um, challenges and, um, and, and, and with that some legal challenges in, in, in how you appoint distributors and how you actually do business there. What we try to do um, during this, um, this research report uh, with PMMI was to outline what we, um, um, you know, what we think are, are, are important benchmarks 
and interview you know, very uh, seasoned and tenured players, both European as well as Brazilian players, to, give, um, to, to, to really extract what, what they're doing and hopefully be able to analyze that together with you to, to, um, to you know, so perhaps shed light or perhaps um, just, just allow you all to benchmark yourselves again, some of um, the best practices, if you would, of local packaging manufacturing companies and European packaging manufacturing companies that are doing business successfully in Brazil. So um, with that, I just wanted to pass the, uh, the word on to Ajay, um, who's going to just walk us through some of the, uh, the benchmarks and the results of the report. Thank you, Anand. Uh, and thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. Uh, well, what Ryan mentioned earlier is that uh, we have been working with TMMI in previous studies. And just uh, the results from those studies and just general market observation, uh, we should all by now be aware of the overwhelming European dominance in the packaging scenario in Brazil. And this stems from uh, various uh, reasons, mainly coming from their first, first mover advantage and that whole by, by Europe influence uh, from the multinationals uh, focused on standardization and global scale and trust, all historic elements that have led to their um, superiority in uh, numbers of machines uh, installed in Brazil. However, uh, in recent years, we have also witnessed a transformation in the industry with the reduced influence of the headquarters on machinery selection and greater decision-making autonomy, uh, especially as it relates to capital good procurements by the local teams. And this is, this is mainly led uh, by the P&L requirements of the local clients having to post profits and uh, giving extra power to their engineering teams to make the procurement decisions. And the customization requirements of the clients saying uh, we don't want standardized machinery, we need uh, machinery that speaks to the Brazilian consumer, and most importantly of all, uh, financing requirements. So having looked at all this, uh, we decided to put together a study that uh, somehow captures the various criteria that influence this choice of the client. Uh, and um, from both the supplier uh, and client's perspective, and uh, we interviewed several suppliers from different uh, packaging companies and of different nationalities, and asked them why, why uh, do their clients uh, prefer one manufacturer from one country over another? And from these results, uh, we managed to draw some great insights uh, as to the current state of play in Brazil, and also to determine the key pressure points uh, that the U.S. manufacturers should work on to increase their business in Brazil. Uh, we selected six criteria, uh, which basically encompasses uh, the study. One is the geopolitical and macroeconomics. Other one is the cultural criteria. Um, how uh, willing is the, is the uh, ma machinery supplier ready to uh, listen to the customer, see what they require, and co-develop technology alongside and negotiate along the terms that are a win-win to both, and that uh, difficulty in establishing that relationship or not, or the ease of it. Another point was the customization. Uh, how willing is the supplier uh, to listen to the client and make changes to their standard, standardized uh, lines? What's the flexibility and adaptation that they would, they would push for? Uh, are the machines able to integrate in existing lines? Because many times uh, the client does not have a huge budget uh, and he wants to just add on and add on. Uh, so you'd have to look at upgrades and um, Joining, joining machines uh, from that do different functions. Financing, how, how competitive are your prices? Uh, the dollar base, do you have financing schemes? Uh, are you willing to discuss terms and conditions uh, such as installments or supplier-based financing? And how is the after-sales service uh, as, a, as a total cost to the, uh, to the overall project? Another criteria was the local presence. Is the supplier present in Brazil? Is it recognized in Brazil? How is it present in Brazil? Does it have a direct subsidiary? 
uh, does it uh, have um, agreement with uh, distributors or representatives? Uh, because installation and aftermarket support, as we have seen in Brazil, is a, and probably as you have seen in many other parts of the world, is uh, of growing importance. And finally, um, actually scoring the machinery uh, that is being supplied is uh, how's the ease of installation. Uh, what is the training that uh, the suppliers are giving to my local team? Uh, is, is the machine user friendly or do I have to keep calling the technical support all the time? And how many, how, what are the ranges? What are the capacity ranges and the application ranges? Because today I want to test the market, so I want to start off small. And then I want to slowly uh, uh, upgrade and, and grow. Does the supplier offer me these various ranges or not? and how reliable and durable are these uh, items. So moving on uh, to slide eight, um, what we see over here is that over a span of 14 years, uh, we can see that the European uh, still dominate, the European suppliers still dominate the, the industry uh, with Italy and Germany leading the pack. But in uh, 2014, what do we, we do notice is that uh, Germany and Italy maintained their market share. However, a lot of companies lost participation with the entry of other European and Asian uh, players. Now, with uh, what Ryan mentioned uh, earlier, that the U.S. has doubled its uh, shipments to Brazil, and uh, still remains a very small percentage of total imports into Brazil. Uh, what's interesting to note over here is that despite this small representation, if you look at the actual project and what the clients were talking about, the U.S. ranks very high up there uh, in terms of their perspective of U.S. manufacturers. We, we, we see that uh, the procurement managers uh, have put, U, put the U.S. almost in equal terms uh, as, uh, as Europe. Now doing a deep dive uh, into the um, different criteria, we'll start off with uh, uh, economic and geopolitical geopolitical and macroeconomic, we see that uh, not surprisingly Brazil receives a low grade as Anand mentioned for many, many reasons, uh, the period of retrenching uh, and uh, negative outlook. However, uh, we do believe that uh, other markets such as Germany and Asia are ranking very high in this, in this regards and that's mainly due to the work done by the governments and agencies to foster business in international markets and, and, and deal with uh, certain restrictions such as environment, environment safety issues that, and clients' demands for uh, specific recycling, recyclable packs or bio, biodegradable packs. So this export-oriented culture stemming from uh, European and now Asian companies is really, uh, is really coming to play in Brazil. Moving on to the next criteria, if we look at cultural criteria, uh, here basically we, what we're looking for is the willingness of suppliers from different countries of origin to consider customer requests and whether they take a rigid or a more lenient stand towards it. For instance, some of the results of the interview showed uh, Italian companies to be highly customer oriented. Many that work with cross-functional engineering teams to build to suit to, to globally build to suit packaging projects for clients in Brazil. And uh, one thing that really came came across is that the Brazilians also do the same. However, the Italians know how to plan, whereas Brazilians still lag behind in the capacity to think long term. Uh, for instance, uh, Italian machinery they leave rooms for future adjustments and upgrades uh, that will arise down the line, whereas. Um, Brazilian companies were more focused on executing on the present, irrespective of the client's growth plans one year from now. And what's also interesting is that Germany uh, ranks very highly on this uh, because they're, very, they're known to be very well vested in the client, into the client's interests. 
Uh, they anticipate the machinery requirements many times even before the client does. And that, that really struck home uh, because um, many of these uh, Brazilian um, manufacturers, given the state of play, they don't know how fast the market will grow. So they need a partner uh, in their supplier based community to really help them uh, adjust according and dance with the music. What's also interesting is that uh, German and American companies, and this, is, this may come as a surprise to many, uh, Brazilian uh, companies are really now focused on uh, building this element of trust uh, and uh, moving away from the do what it takes mentality and quick fix attitudes. If you look at the professional culture that is developed in Brazil, they are welcoming uh, the, the uh, culture of ethics and professional codes of conduct that are typically um, linked with German companies and with American companies. So this is a very good moment for uh, American companies to come in uh, because many of the professional companies are saying, please, please, we want to do things correctly. Moving on to another criteria, which is the customization criteria. Now here, uh, what we're seeing is that uh, clients are increasingly measuring their capital expenditure purchases on performance and results. Uh, it's, many clients have mentioned this, that uh, the idea is to reduce the conversion cost of their raw materials into finished goods. Uh, automation plays a big role over here, but everyone wants to produce more with less resources. Uh, particularly with what Anand mentioned about the uh, exorbitant rates of uh, labor over here, and which is considered a very large and unstable component to the operating expense. European companies are known for their cooperations with local engineers uh, and are helping with this flexibility uh, to develop customized machines whereas Brazilian companies have the added advantage of being able to backward integrate their metal works of a machine and customize exactly to the client requirements based on the project designs. And this really uh, hits a home run with many of their clients who want to co-develop and adapt their machines. And uh, for, for us in, in, in the US, uh, there's a very good market perception uh, that US packaging manufacturers have as it relates to innovation and automation, um, ease of use, and um, what, what are the negative aspects that we need to work on is that uh, many clients still believe that uh, American companies uh, are labeled as one-size-fit-all suppliers uh, focused on standardized products. And uh, while we may argue that uh, this one-size-fits-all does work for many clients, uh, uh, clients tend to give a preference to companies with uh, best prices and where customization is required. So this is something we do need to work on according to the study. Moving forward, uh, financial parameters, well I'm not going to drill too much into this because Anand mentioned, but uh, one of the main uh, issues over here is, um, is um, how, how, do you, how do you sponsor this purchase? Uh, client financing structures for capital good investments. Uh, Finami, uh, I'm sure many of you must have heard the, the, the term, but it's a, it's a financing mechanism offered by the government for, for locally uh, manufactured uh, machines um, that have at least a minimum of 60% of the components uh, that are produced locally. So what we're starting to see is many uh, European companies and Asian companies and uh, recently American companies trying to acquire local uh, uh, companies that are already operating just to benefit from this program so they can offer cheaper financing for their clients. Um, European manufacturers are working heavily with their uh, banks and their governments to offer uh, more credit uh, and financing of goods um, and tax tr and trade credit with export insurance and Italian Italian machine suppliers are more concerned concerned with the deal 
and um, are also offering short-term and long-term credit in order to secure the deal. What's interesting to note over here is that the German culture, uh, from, what, from what the interviews mentioned, is that they are selling the machine for what it's worth and not for what we perceive the client is willing to pay for it. That's what the Germans were saying. So the starting price does not leave much room for negotiation. And uh, rather than focusing on price discussions, uh, these German suppliers, they prefer to focus on technical discussions which has really uh, done wonders for their uh, business in Brazil. And they focus on the advantages over other solutions available, such as machinery metrics, the return on investment, capacity utilization efficiency indices, and uh, wrapper and raw material savings, uh, uh, safety, minimizing machinery downtime, and, and really focusing on the general pack quality for zero market complaints. So where you cannot compete on price, these are the elements that should be worked with jointly with the, with the, um, with the uh, client. Moving on, local market presence. This is increasingly becoming important for many of the companies that want to do the full body immersion, as Anand mentioned. Uh, we, we are seeing that uh, Many of the American companies have uh, renewed uh, or have a more diligent effort to scout and appoint reputable distributors and representative agents uh, to increase orders um, and focus on customer service and strengthening the ties with the supplier, uh, I mean the supplier-client ties. It is possible to do that with local representation uh, to bridge that extensive, uh, any, any cultural learning curves. And, and definitely focus on increased business. And finally, uh, moving on to uh, the actual machinery. What we have noticed over here is that um, the Italians have a strong reputation for capacity and application ranges, uh, considered by some clients as far ahead of any uh, other competitor, including the US. Germany, German machines are known for their technological competence, durability, and sturdiness. Um, what, what, what many uh, companies are doing now is because they have local uh, presence, they, they can uh, sponsor fully functional showrooms that showcase the product lines and allow uh, the conversation or the sales conversation to move away from commercial only towards commercial and technical. And this is very, very important, uh, particularly when you're conduct conducting tests uh, that take into account shelf life and energy savings and uh, capacity flexibility and adaptations that the machine can do. So all these points uh, really are, are important. And, uh, and whereas the Brazilian companies, they also do offer machine testing. And uh, many times they have multiple clients that they've already sold to, so they direct the, the prospective client uh, to go and visit these sites. So uh, some of these, uh, these are some of the criteria that you'll find in our study. And um, I pass it on back to Anand. Um, thank you, Jay. I know that that's a, that's a lot of information. There's a lot of, uh, lot of criteria that we, we obviously looked at, and there's, there's um, there's a lot of case uh, case history at, at the um, you know in the report, which I encourage you all to to read through. I didn't want to get into um, what individual companies were doing during this presentation, but be happy to uh, to field questions for um, you know uh, on on any of these benchmark parameters and uh, and how we've seen you know successful differentiation strategies. Um, I did want to um, you know leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, one being obviously that uh, you know there's 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 a lot of things to consider when you're looking at uh, Brazil. There's one of the big things is obviously local presence. Um, you know, I think that if if you take a look at all the European companies and um, and obviously all the Brazilian companies, they're they're, they're they're real differentiation. You know, from from most of the parameters that we've outlined is the fact that they have local presence and the fact that they can actually um, put together longer term financing packaging uh, pack packages. Um, as part of their product offering, right? So I don't want to know if the product is worth $100, but I want to know, you know, if I can pay, 
you know, $10 a month for 10 months. It's because you know, as a consumer in Brazil, that's more important to me. And you can charge me $200 at that point because you know, I'd, I'd, I'd happily pay you $10 for 20 months uh, because that's still going to be a lot cheaper for me. And you know, one, one that, once that sort of crystallizes in our, in our heads in terms of strategy, there's many ways to move forward. You know, one, of the, one of the simple ways is just to establish a local, a local company in Brazil. Lawyers will tell you it's impossible and it's very expensive, and you know, it, it's not. It's, it's, it's relatively simple. They're, they're obviously running expenses to it, so you need to have enough of a revenue base uh, um, already, already built into your, um, in, into, your, into your business to do that. Um, but what you can do is you can benefit from a, you know, transfer pricing. You can benefit from um, outsourcing some of the manufacturing in Brazil and getting the, uh, the 60% value add. Um, and offering um, you know financial packages to your um, to your to your distributors or even to your end clients, and and obviously you know um, having legal control on your brand on your IP in a way that you you can appoint as many distributors as you want without having you know without ever being a hostage to one. Um, and and I've seen that there's a lot of um, there's a, there's a lot of evidence that European companies you know. They, they don't backtrack into this. They go into this with their eyes wide open, and they're actually doing that. Um, the other thing that I've noticed over the last six months more so than, uh, than, than, than lately is the fact that Brazilian, local Brazilian manufacturers are, are A, very good, and B, you know, very cheap right now, A, given the exchange rate, and B, given the, the weakening uh, economy. So I've, I've seen that there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of I mean, a, a lot of renewed interest, and you know, I, I've got I've got um, a real life example of about six companies over the last uh, you know eight months that I've uh, in packaging space that we've looked at, where where there's just been acquisitions happening by European companies and in a couple of cases by even uh, U.S. Uh, private equity funds, um, just buying up uh, um, companies in Brazil to take advantage of the of, of all the benchmarks that we've discussed, but in a way that uh, that's quite cheap just because it's um, you know the EBITDA multiples now in Brazil are very, very low compared to what they were three years ago when you know everyone absolutely had to be there. Um, so so th- th- these are two thoughts um, I wanted to uh, to leave you with. And then the, the, the last thought I wanted to leave you with is that Brazil is not only about the Brazilian market. It's obviously about the South American market in, in general. You know, once you're once you're in Brazil, you have a free trade zone into Argentina, into uh, Chile, into Colombia, into uh, into uh, Uruguay and Paraguay. Um, and um, w- 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 what we've seen is that Brazilian companies, Brazilian consumer product companies, are buying up companies all over Latin America. And all over the world, quite honestly. I mean, if, you know, I guess the, the the biggest and the best example is you know 3G, um, which is a, a a group of you know three Brazilian private equity guys that have uh, that have gone out and obviously they bought you know notoriously bought Anheuser Busch, Burger King, um, and more recently you know Kraft and Heinz, um, you know together with Warren Buffett. And these are now you know allegedly Brazilian controlled companies. Um, so there's a lot of Packaging decisions, a lot of um, uh, um, strategic decisions that are happening in Brazil globally. Um, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting place, um, uh, and it's, it's a small place to network. Um, at the end of the day, you know, despite the 210 million people, you know, there's there's um, few decision makers, um, and there's a lot of consolidation at the consumer product uh, levels. Um, you've uh, you've obviously cre- you've got a You've got two of the largest, you know, protein uh, manufacturing companies in the world, um, uh, based in Brazil. Now they're both uh, publicly traded. I'd encourage you to take a look at these, uh, the the, the, tra- the the case histories of these. It's uh, JBS and um, and BRF Foods, um, you know, largest poultry manufacturer in the world, largest pig, um, you know, uh, pig 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 and um, uh, cow farming uh, company in the world. So so we're looking at global giants here um, that are obviously dictating the trend for you know both end user packaging as well as uh, bulk packaging for for supply chains, and um, it's 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 something that I wanted to just leave you leave you with as a as a thought. Um, I'm I'm not really going to go too much into the last slide. It's more of a you know. A, you know what, what 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 we do to help uh, some of our clients think think through the um, the uh, you know the the, the 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 speed and direction at which they have to create local presence. Um, so I'll just uh, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, be very very happy to you know take questions or um, or, or to help um, to help. Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, further further illustrate any of the points that we've we've briefly touched on today. Great, thank you, Anand. That was a very insightful presentation. A lot of meat there to to chew on for everyone. Um, this presentation uh, and the recording of the webinar I will share with everybody on the call today. Uh, be sure to download the report online as well. Uh, it goes into great detail uh, profiling a number of companies, OEMs, that are uh, in Brazil, uh, doing business in Brazil. Uh, that um, you know, It goes into what, what some of their best practices are for, and how they're getting competitive advantage in Brazil. And, you know, that leads me to my first question that I have for you. You know, there's a big difference in Brazil between a company that exports to Brazil and a company that has a local presence in Brazil. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of benefits to have a local presence in Brazil. Uh, talking to some of uh, PMI members that are in Brazil, in fact, um, a number of companies that you profiled in the report, uh, they're all in Brazil, uh, building machines in Brazil for that are geared towards more or less the middle market in Brazil. Uh, is that a, a trend that you've seen, Anand, or is that a trend that's going to change? You, you mentioned there's a lot more customization going on in Brazil. It's not just about uh, price anymore and selling kind of a reliable machine. Uh, it's more or less now where they're looking at flexibility and ways that they can really reduce costs with uh, automation. Um, is that a trend that you're seeing uh, pick up in Brazil? Ryan, I, I, absolutely yes. Um, I, I'd almost argue that you... you you know, I, I've seen very little evidence of companies doing, um, you know, very much business unless they have a unique patent, uh, unless they're established in Brazil, um, either through a trading uh, entity or through a trading slash manufacturing um, assembly entity. Right. And are you seeing different? Are you, uh, Brazil was known for a long time that uh, employment was relatively cheap, I would say. I mean, we're at full employment in Brazil right now, so, uh, you know, a lot, you have a lot of uh, the, the labor on the line, uh, particularly in doing the secondary part of the line. Uh, is it still manual, uh, or are we moving towards automating the second, secondary part of the line? No, absolutely moving towards automating it, Ryan. Um, you know, again, there's a there's a great uh, a great saying that uh, that I think it was a, it was I think the president of Glencore that coined it. it, it he said that you know the, the the cure for high prices is high prices, um, and uh, you know again because we've been with uh, at, at a situation of full employment, um, you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the companies have been investing very very heavily in you know end of line and then middle middle line uh, automation. Um, you know again all labor in Brazil is unionized um, and irrespective of what happens, you know, um, with the economy or with your business, you know, if you're employing people there and the union says that you've got to increase their wages by 7.5% that year, guess what? You've got to increase their wages by 7.5%. Um, so so it's, 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 um, it's one of these very, very rigid, it's, it's sort of, a, I, I joke with my, uh, my clients, it's like, you know, it's the, worst of, it's the worst of France with the worst of Portugal put together in terms of labor laws. So, you know, where, wherever you can actually, you know, shed some, uh, shed some costs, and and it is exactly now in, in in a down market where that's that's ever ever more prevalent. Very interesting. Again, I just want to remind everybody: if you want to ask a question, uh, just enter it in the lower left uh, chat box there, and uh, send it either to me or an Anand, and we'll make sure it's read. Uh, one more quick question: Brazil has a lot of local manufacturers. I mean, you, and, and you've profiled a couple in the report. Uh, one of them was Messal. Uh, but you also have Indumac and, and uh, a behemoth down in Brazil, probably has most of the market share in Brazil, is Mazipak, Fabrima. Um, these guys are offering, you know, complete lines. Um, you know, a lot of their equipment maybe is not as good as most PMMI members, um, but they are offering a number of different solutions and have huge product portfolios. Do you see them, how do you see them evolving? And, and you know, are are they going to be able to defend their market share in Brazil? Are they going to kind of lose it? Or are they going to be looking at expanding into North America? Uh, what's what's uh, the makeup of some of the Brazilian companies and where you see them going? Yeah, I mean, so you know, they, they've all they've all obviously started off as one trick ponies, right? You know, one you know one uh, you know, for example, Indumac, you know, very very focused on. You know, uh, uh, vertical um, packing for uh, for fill seal for you know uh, commodities, right? And and if you look at them, their their largest market 
you know, outside of Brazil, there's actually Nigeria, now India, Indonesia, Thailand, um, and uh, they've, they've just opened up a couple of companies in the U.S. So yes, I mean, these Brazilian companies, they're, they're the good ones, you know, like, in the, like, like, uh, like Indomac you mentioned, they're, they're growing, and they're, they're you know, uh, they took advantage of uh, when, especially the last three years, where Bra the Brazilian exchange rate was, um, was uh, beneficial for Brazilian companies making acquisitions abroad. They have taken advantage of, um, of uh, establishing presences abroad. Now, with the Brazilian exchange rate the way it is, they are taking full advantage of all that export. Right. So, um, you know, even, even if you look at Mizal or uh, Fabrima, you know, and I won't get into the, the, the weeds of, you know, the cultural issues with these companies because, uh, you know, I don't think they're, they're particularly well run. But there's a very, very clear directive towards exports and towards line integration. So, in, you know, they're increasingly um, uh, uh, either acquiring companies um, or, or acquiring talent away from companies to be able to, uh, to, to grow into uh, um, consumer lines, you know. Um, and, um, and, I, and I don't think that's going to change. I think that's actually going to get um, even, even stronger uh, with, the slow, with, you know, with, with the slowing economy. Very interesting. I have a couple questions coming in here. Uh, first one, uh, very important topic down in Brazil, financing. Uh, you, you know, Bendis Bank and Finama, they have been, there's been, uh, the OECD has been very critical of, of their lending practices. They, they lend at rates well below market value, and they just saturate the market with uh, tons of money out there if you're a local uh, Brazilian company or if you're manufacturing in Brazil. Um, uh, having access to Finom and, and Bundesbank money really can give you a, an advantage down there. Is is Finom money drying up? Uh, is it still being released at the moment with uh, the, the the current uh, economic situation in Brazil? Um, Ryan, it is drying up. Um, it's that, that that's not to say that it's it's stopped. Um, Finami is still a very very um, well capitalized program. The issue is that it was growing at you know 30% a year, and now you're going to have you know uh, somewhat of a correction on that. Um, a as a government tries to uh, um, you know, uh, and and this is a little bit of this is almost more philosophical at this point because um, the the finance minister is a very pro market guy, and he's you know, over the last six years, and I've actually sat with him in seminars where we we're both presenting to a, to a group of investors in New York, and he's outright, I outrightly criticized the BNDS and the Finami program for what he termed as a crowd out effect, meaning crowding out the private banks, um, you know, the commercial banks from what they should be doing, which is lending commercially. Having said that, if you're lending commercially at 5 or 6% a month, Dude, if I get if I get access to BNDS money at LIBOR minus one, I'm going there, right? I'm going to go and try to get that. So it's 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 a little bit of a a, a, a pull pull and push uh, uh, thing right now. I don't think we can do without the BNDS because um, you know uh, local capital markets are just they're just too expensive for capital goods. Um, and uh, you know, I, but I do think that there's going to be a a, a a definite increase in quality of credit at the BNDS. There's going to be a lot more scrutiny in, term, in terms of takers. Um, uh, as an example, you know, look, we, we, you know, we sitting at an advisory firm um, a few years ago got a credit card from the BNDS mailed to our office without us even asking for it, right? Hmm. You know, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the idea that, look, you know, you can use a BNDS credit card under the Tsunami program to go buy, you know, capital goods for your office, you know, computers, um, automobiles, what have you. Uh, that type of you know aggressive lending is definitely stopping. But you know um, um, good vendors that are that are uh, that are uh, that are uh, accredited with the Finami program, they're going to be they're, they're still going to be able to offer that program to their customers. Very interesting. So uh, going on a little bit uh, past Finam, and we're talking about uh, some tax breaks loopholes that. Uh, importers might be able to take advantage of. Uh, I, I remember in the past that Brazil would always do a ex terrifico kind of tax break uh, where there would be a holiday on, on some of the import duties for uh, uh, you know, imports that are coming into Brazil. Is that something that uh, Brazil is going to continue doing? Is, is that something that you can um, you know, you can see coming down the pipeline, or and, and how do you know companies take advantage of that? Do you have to prove that you're um, 
importing a product that isn't being uh, manufactured locally in Brazil? What, what are some of the steps to take advantage of some of those uh, tax breaks for importers? Okay, so the ex is 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 relatively simple. The the you know usually um, you know uh, you're looking at about 14% import duty, and what happens is that there's a cascading set of duties um, and taxes on that. So it's 14% import duty. Um, say you're you're exporting your FOB or your 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 landed price um, in 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 Brazil, which is you know FOB plus a freight is a hundred dollars. You pay 14% on not only your, your, your equipment, but you also pay the 14% on the freight. All right? So you pay 14% on your landed cost. Right? After that, you still have another 8%, which is the IPI, and then another uh, 18%, which is um, the ICMS, which is the value added tax. And that's all cumulative on that you know, uh, landed cost, meaning your cost plus the freight plus the import duty, then plus the IPI. So what happens is that the ex tarifario is something that, that a lot of you know a lot of our clients use it over here, um, and it's it's very simple to uh, to do. It takes about three months. It costs about five thousand dollars to do. Um, the caveat is that you need to prove that you have a unique equipment that's not currently produced in Brazil. Okay, if you can prove that, then it's it's about a you know again two and a half three month process. You know five thousand um, uh, dollars total cost, and you get uh, a a reduction of duty from the 14% on the import duty to 2%. But so that doesn't mean that you get a 12% reduction. You get a much more than 12% reduction because you have cascading taxes on those um, 14%. Now you have cascading taxes on only 2%, right? So it's definitely something worth doing if you, can, if, if you are um, confident that you don't have any you know, local manufacturers that, uh, that uh, produce your, your, your product range or your product speed or your product uh, 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 sort of patent in, in Brazil. So that's all you need to do is just establish that uh, some differentiator in terms of maybe it's the patent or IP or something like that that uh, is, yeah. is something that's not yet produced in Brazil. Yeah, look, Great. We, uh, we, we, did, we did two of these for, for our clients this month. You know, um, and, you know, it's, it's, really not, it's really not that difficult at all. Oh, so if you're interested in, in uh, exploring that possibility of taking advantage of ex uh contact Anand, uh, and it uh, looks like he'll be able to help you with that. Uh, I have another question that came in. Um, boy, private consumption in Brazil, there's been a lot of talk about it. Um, you, know, you mentioned it was stagnating. Uh, I assume that's largely due to, to the inflation in Brazil right now. Um, Nestle's CEO just recently said, too, that uh, he's very concerned about inflation in Brazil and, and, and some of their investments there. Um, you know, there is record low unemployment. There has been government stimulus programs and tax breaks to kind of spur consumption. But with the stop-and-go cycles in the economy, I mean, do you see the consumer base continuing to be the engine of growth? Um, and and, and you know, maybe not in general the consumer base, but are there any pockets or segments, uh, you know, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical, cosmetics, um, you know, uh, food, um, where do you see uh, growth coming in, in end markets for packaging machinery? Okay. Well, that's, that's you know, we, we've done a lot of, a, you know, a lot of work on that specific question, um, and we've created a few scenarios for, um, for ourselves and some of our clients. And, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the short answer, and I can go on for as long as you want me to on this, but um, there is going to be a stagnation in consumer growth in Brazil. That doesn't mean that, that consumers are going to stop buying what they're used to buying, right? Because if they were just buying you know, exponentially more than what they did last year and the year before that because they were, they, they, they were a, um, there was a lot more offer in terms of number of SKUs out there, and then B, there was a lot more credit. So today we're in a situation where consumers, you know, 58 million consumers are what we call at the credit-bearing uh, uh, limit capacity, right? So there's going to be, you know, a couple of quarters of some stagnation in terms of consumer growth. That doesn't mean that you know, consumers are going to stop buying, you know, processed foods and packaged uh, package foods and, uh, and cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, right? Um, do I see a small potential dip in cosmetics? Yes, but um, I do see that being short-lived. And uh, I don't think that you um, can, can, can selectively take, you know, a vertical like cosmetics and say, well, it's not going to do as well as um, pharmaceuticals. For example, the hair products 
in cosmetics are still growing in double digits, you know, despite the, uh, the recession, right? Um, and then you look at some of the, um, you know, the, 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 the demographic um, uh, social, social classifications. And, you know, you look at the A and the B classes, and they really haven't been affected by the crisis, and they won't be, right, because they're not levered, right? In fact, when they put money in a bank, they're earning 1% interest per month. So if you have $100,000 in a bank, you're earning $1,000 by doing absolutely nothing in Brazil, right? So, that, so, from, from, so from that social demographic standpoint, you know, the, the product lines that cater to, to you know, the rich and the, the upper middle class, they're actually enjoying the growth. Um, you know, the, the, the bulk of it, this, the, the, what we call the C, D, and E classes, yes, they're retrenching. Um, you know, how many quarters are we trenched for? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm estimating at least two quarters. Um, the government's talking about, oh, yeah, you know, next, within the next month we'll see uh, an up, uptake. I don't see that. I, I see it as being somewhere closer to six months um, and potentially even nine months. And what, 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 one of the interesting parts about this, I was talking to a Brazilian consumer product manufacturer, and they're, they're actually launching um, smaller uh, pack SKUs. Um, and you, you, you now have you know, multinational companies adopting what the uh, strategies that they were adopting in India, which is just reducing the size of packaging um, and increasing the number of uh, SKUs that, uh, that every product line has. So from a pack packaging standpoint, it's actually, you know, arguably good news. Mm -hmm. You know, Ryan, caveat is that I'm a consultant. I always have to be positive, right? <laughs> And I, and I, there's still a lot to be positive about in Brazil. Absolutely, I know it's a it's a tough time. We're in kind of in a down cycle right now. But um, I mean, if you look at some of the numbers, Brazil is a behemoth of a market. It's here on our back, you know, backyard. Uh, you know, same time zone. Um, great place to visit. But you know, it's it's a market that just can't be ignored. I mean, if you're looking at numbers, uh, you know. Brazil has unbelievable potential to grow, particularly if, if some of these reforms start going through and, and they achieve a little bit more financial stability. Uh, you know, there's, there's going to be tremendous opportunity there for packaging machinery manufacturers. Um, we're up against uh, our, our 11 o'clock end time here. Uh, I want to thank Anand and AJ for a great presentation. If anybody has any questions for Anand or AJ, please contact them. Uh, their contact information, I believe, is at the front of the presentation here. Okay, well, it's not. Well, I'll be sending you a email with a recording uh, with the slide deck here, and I will be sure to include their contact information. Uh, these gentlemen are a great resource in Brazil. Um, talk to them before you uh, decide to go to Brazil. If you already are already in Brazil uh, and you need uh, help navigating the market, uh, feel free to reach out to them and be sure to download the report they just did. It's an excellent report. Uh, I also want to remind everybody, PMMI will be at FISPAL this year. And FISPAL is the, the, probably the biggest packaging show in Brazil. It's in Sao Paulo uh, between the 23rd and 26th of June. Uh, if you're down there, please visit our booth. Uh, Anand will be around, and, and uh, I think we're going to have a, uh, a luncheon with Anand where he'll be sharing a presentation. You can get to talk to him in person if you're in Sao Paulo at that time. So. Um, we invite you to come visit us in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining the presentation today. Thank you Anand and AJ. Uh, good luck with your business ventures in Brazil everyone and have a good day.